one of my favorite directors of all time, just released his 11th movie. Today, we're going to rank them. What is up, Fleet fans? Welcome back to my channel. You know what this is. You've probably seen five, six other rankings on YouTube this week. Well, guess what? I'm doing it, except I'm doing it in tier list form because that's what we do on this channel. And at the end of the video, I will rearrange my rankings and have from 11 to 1, including Tenet. That's why we're doing this. This movie dropped. I wanted to see this movie for a second time, though. I was able to check it out again with my wife. Some things have been determined in my head, and I'm going to do my best job to rank this after only two watches when I've watched some of these other films like 10 times. So it's difficult to compare. That's what YouTube is. It's a comparison game. And you also may be wondering, Austin, didn't you do one of these in 2019? Yes, I did. But you may see some differences now compared to then because, again, rewatches make all the difference in the world, and there will be different films on different tiers this time around. But let's start with the beginning. Batman Begins. I was scared to death of this movie as a kid. It comes out in 2005. I was 10 years old. Do the math. I'm 25 now. I was used to the Joel Schumacher version of Batman, the Tim Burton version, a, a much lighter in tone. But Christopher Nolan delivered something that I believe was game changing for the Batman world, the Batman universe. And even though it has taken me a while to not come around on this film because I really enjoyed it when I was younger, uh, but as I got older, I began to appreciate it more. The inclusion of Liam Neeson, the beginning of this version of Batman, who kind of grew into one of my favorite on-screen superheroes of all time. I think Christian Bale shines in this film. And a lot of people will tell you this, and I'll tell you the same thing. The Dark Knight is... Maybe not all about the Joker, but I would say less of a Batman-centric story than Batman Begins, and that's why I believe it is an awesome movie. I love going back and watching this because it is the ultimate interpretation of the beginning of Bruce Wayne building his way up to what we see and what we know now from the final two movies in the trilogy as... Batman. Uh, not the one and only, but one of the best I've ever seen on screen. Again, Liam Neeson is fantastic as Ra's al Ghul. Again, I think uh, Killian Murphy as Scarecrow, I have praised him countless times on this channel. He's one of my favorite underrated actors in a sense. Every time he comes on screen, he crushes it. That's why he continues to team up with Christopher Nolan. Um, amazing in this movie. So many good elements. My only um, criticism of this first film and one thing that keeps it from being one of my top two or three favorite Nolan films is the fact that I just, I didn't love the interpretation of Rachel in this movie. That's what I'll say. Maybe it was the acting, maybe it was the script, but I didn't love it. I think it was the acting. So next up, we're actually going to go backwards and move into Christopher Nolan's very first movie, and that is following. It is very much a noir film all about this man who kind of gets sucked into this underworld as he begins following people. He's very interested in people. This is a black and white film. It is unlike anything else in Christopher Nolan's repertoire resume. I'll say this. I think it is a good movie. I really do. And that's why I'm going to put it on the good tier. But there are certain things about this film that prevent it from being great. And certain moments that you can look at and say, okay, Nolan is clearly um, in the midst of his early stages of his filmmaking career. And if I would have seen this film at the time, it, obviously I had to come back around to it because I was three years old, uh, I probably wouldn't have been super pumped or hyped for Nolan in a way I would have been for some other directors that start out crushing it, right? But now going back to this movie, you can see the techniques that he was using and how he slowly molded it and crafted it into what he brings to the table now. And uh, you'll see when I give my ranking, it is extremely low on this list. But again, I'm just such a fan of Nolan's style, it's not a style for everyone, that even the lower movies on my lists, even if it's at the bottom, spoilers, um, that doesn't mean it's bad, and that's why it's on the good tier. That just means I'm a huge fan of the work from Christopher Nolan, uh, and I am a fan of what he did in this film, but it's not the most uh, rewatchable in my opinion. Next up, actually the next two that we have. I have to create a special tier for them. I did the exact same thing in my last video, so this shouldn't come as a surprise for you all, but we are going to add a row above, change the color to the brightest white we can find, and just gaze upon 
the all-time tier, because as you guys know, if you've seen my favorite movies of all time, Nolan has some all-timers for me. And what that means in my terms is a movie that cracks my top 30 movies of all time. So you may even see some films on this awesome tier that will make my top 50, my top 100. This is only films in my top 30, and I did that because both Inception and The Dark Knight are in my top 30 movies of all time. Let's start with Inception. Inception changed the game for me. It did for me what certain other films in the 80s and 90s did for those who grew up with those movies and were just blown away in the theater. I was blown away after watching Inception, even though uh, my feeble young brain couldn't handle the madness that Nolan had awaiting me in that theater. It was absolutely wild. Now, is it his most challenging movie ever? No, but I was watching it at an age to where I couldn't quite comprehend what was happening, uh, but now that I somewhat know the entirety of the film, even though the ending is still ambiguous to some, um, I'm a huge fan. I'm a massive fan of Inception, enough to make it one of my top ten movies of all time. I just love the way this story flows. And you'll hear this from everyone, but I will repeat it. There is exposition in this film, but this is one of the few cases when I see this and I say, that's kind of necessary exposition. It's almost integral to a point to where if it wasn't happening on screen and I wasn't getting that feedback from the characters, I wouldn't quite comprehend what was going on. And that is an issue that some people have with Tenet is we just didn't get enough, right? It's too baffling and confusing. And I do believe that movie is more confusing than Inception in the grand scheme of things. And maybe this is why. Maybe it's because we got something from our characters played effortlessly by Leo and Tom Hardy, and Marion Cotillard, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and everyone in this movie is fantastic. I'm just a huge fan of the story, and the biggest thing for this film for me, you can go dream layer after dream layer and get to all these set pieces and the music, Hans Zimmer's score, one of my favorites of all time, uh, but it really all comes down to that emotional connection between our two main characters, Maul and Cobb. I believe they are the central figures in this film, Ellen Page's character as well, uh, but it is so heartbreaking the first time you see that scene of what her fate truly was. And that storyline carries us through even some of the moments that, you know, don't necessarily stand out compared to the others that are more grand and entertaining. The hallway sequence is one for me. But Inception just does so much right. And I love watching this film. I've seen it 12, 13 times. I have to put it on the all-time tier. And that is the same case for The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight, eh, you guys know how I feel. When we get into the final ranking, you'll see which one I prefer. It is so difficult to place these two one over the other because they're both so fantastic. For what Inception did uh, when it comes to sci-fi, for what Dark Knight did in terms of superhero movies, how it changed the game. And whether you want to argue it's more of a Joker film or more of a Batman film or not, and I see both points there, it doesn't matter. It's a freaking great movie. It is a fantastic movie. It holds up to this day. There are certain superhero movies in the mid-2000s I watch today. I'm just like, yeah, it doesn't hold up as well. Uh, those that do hold up, like an Iron Man and, and like a Dark Knight, they work extremely well. And it's just beautifully shot, beautifully compact together in such a tight way. The pacing is awesome. I am invested and thrilled by every scene. I know some people have criticisms with the third act. I love the third act, the way that the Joker is just sitting there and pulling the strings and manipulating. And you can see behind me, Heath Ledger's Joker is clearly one of my favorite characters of all time. I would maybe even put him above how I feel about Christian Bale as the Batman. I just, I love everything about that. I'm even a fan of Two-Face. Not everyone loves Harvey Dent in this film. I love the way he was portrayed. I like how, again, the Joker's manipulation runs through. It runs through everyone, not just Harvey Dent, uh, but how that progresses and the finale, the voiceover by Commissioner Gordon and the way that it all wraps up. I just, I love this film so much. I could talk about it for days, but those two movies, all timers for me. Next up, the psychological game of Cat and Mouse featuring Robin Williams and Al Pacino. This is insomnia. Uh, I put it on the good tier, even though I am very close to putting it on the great tier. I think there's a lot within this film that works oh so well. I think the tension being built by Nolan, I believe, 
uh, looking at this kind of movie and comparing it to something like, well, we'll say recently like a Wind River, prior to that a Fargo, it doesn't have that comedic sense that Fargo has, uh, but there's a lot good within here. My issue is the story is just not as interesting as I think Nolan wanted it to be, and it doesn't measure up to what you expect with Pacino and Williams. Don't get me wrong. The performances, again, I, I think Williams could have been nominated. I think Pacino could have been nominated. Everyone in this movie rocks it. And the story progresses in an interesting way. I'm not saying it doesn't. But just like following, it's not a film that I find myself ever going back to or wanting, needing to revisit. Again, I would just revisit similar movies from different directors. And it's rare I say that about someone other than Nolan. But that is unfortunately the case for Insomnia. But again, I say unfortunately... I still think it's a good film. I really do. Really good elements. Uh, just very different from everything else Nolan has given us, even though I would like to see him go back and attempt something like this soon. More so than maybe a sci-fi or an action-heavy movie. All right, here's one of the biggies. Here is a film for me that has changed drastically over the years. The more I think about it, the more I watch it. Now, I say watch it, and I haven't actually watched it in a bit, but I've watched it so many times and I just, I can't stop thinking about the emotion that comes from this film. There is so much there, and it is such a spectacle. I love the technical aspects of a movie. That's why when I watch Interstellar, I'm just I'm kind of mesmerized. Not only the visual effects, but Hans Zimmer's score may be one of his best ever. I love the piano. I love the planet scene with the giant waves and how that intensity builds and the fact that they're and Nolan does this a lot on the clock throughout the entire film, I think Interstellar is truly an awesome movie. And I wasn't there the first time. I would have said, great, the first time I watched it. And maybe even great the second time. But again, that's the rewatchability of some of these films and having that connection to McConaughey's character, uh, loving his daughter the way that he does. Well, his entire family, his son as well, who's portrayed by Casey Affleck, but it's that connection. Now, I have seen some criticisms when it comes to the actual trajectory of both of these plot points not necessarily meshing up as well. And I see that in a sense, but it doesn't bother me narratively because Nolan's kind of known for changing up the game, and I believe he changed it up. My big issue the first time watching was that third act and the love aspect of the movie. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, it took me a bit to kind of find out what Nolan was trying to do there, but I think I've got it at this point. I think I see what his intentions were, even though I'm not 100% there yet on that ending. Uh, but again, he's that kind of director. Most will not rewatch this movie to get to this point, but... I rewatched it so many times, and um, I have to put it on the awesome tier. Next up is The Prestige. The Prestige is another one. Austin, you, you're going to keep saying this. You're going to keep repeating yourself. I really enjoyed it that first time, but going back and being mesmerized by Hugh Jackman's performance, Christian Bell's performance, the fact that Nolan is tackling uh, both literally and metaphorically magic, whether it's on screen or within his narrative, uh, I thought he crushed this film. I also always go back and I'm like, oh yeah, Scarlett Johansson. She's really good in this movie. Everyone's really good. And this is just a different story from Nolan in a time period that he hasn't tackled since. I love the inclusion of someone like an Andy Serkis crushing the role. This buildup and that reveal, and I won't get into spoilers even though it's an older film, that reveal that just mesmerized me the first time I watched it, going back and picking up on all of the context clues... I love movies that you can go back and just soak in different details, and that's exactly what I did with The Prestige. I think The Prestige is a great movie. No, an awesome movie that I may not have felt that way the first time watching. So I think it belongs on that tier for me personally. I'm interested to see out of all of the films, where does The Prestige fall for you? So here's one. Dunkirk is really divisive, like more divisive than I would expect because watching it for the first time, that theatrical experience I remember is one of my favorites from that year. Beautiful. Every sense of the word, audio wise, visually. Now, I do believe, and here's my main issue with the movie, I do believe that the way that this film is handled and the multiple storylines and how they all converge on each other, again, Nolan util utilizing time, except this time it has to do with the editing in the film, um, it may not work as well as some other war films I've seen, and it may not be a decision that I would have signed off on if I knew how it was going to turn out. 
I think if this would have been told in more of a straightforward way, more casual audience members would love this movie. Now, I still probably like Dunkirk more than some others. I am on board with a lot of the critics that said it should have been nominated that year. I just think it's a beautiful technical experience. But I have slowly, not declined, I have slowly started to agree more and more that it's so, not confusing, that's not the word, but just kind of convoluted, that I just don't have the urge to go back and rewatch it as much as I hoped I would have watching it for the first time in the theater. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I think it has slowly turned into a bad movie. It just doesn't have what it once had for me. Maybe it's because I saw 1917 and prefer that movie. No, that's not the case. I just, I, I believe Dunkirk maybe could have done more with the way it was told, but I still think it's beautiful. I still think the performances are fantastic, even though there's not a ton said in the movie. It's more about how it's handled, and I look at a film like Memento, which I'm going to go ahead and throw it on the awesome tier because it's awesome. Um, and that is like the prime example of how to switch up the way a narrative flows and just execute it magnificently. This may be Nolan's crowning achievement, even though, as you can see, it's not my personal favorite. Uh, this is a personal list. I'm not saying, what's the best Nolan movie? I'm saying, what's my favorite Nolan movie? But Memento, at the end of the day, may truly be, if not the best, at least in the conversation. It is incredible. It has everything you never knew that you wanted in a film. Guy Pierce, first of all, his performance is really, really good. Uh, the inclusion of black and white to go along with the color correction... And the mystery of this film, as it's unfolding, but not unfolding in a way that we're used to, that we're familiar with, the film is, <laughs> Tenet, moving towards each other in real time, except we are getting both the end and the beginning of the story slowly folding towards the middle, and that is the conclusion of the film. Huh? Yeah, that's something I had to wrap my head around the first time. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't get it. I had to go back, and I had to rewatch it. And that's exactly what I have done with Memento. Uh, on numerous occasions, multiple times, it is awesome. It is so awesome. Uh, it's one that you can never watch enough to pick up on all of the, again, context clues and details, something that's often included in Nolan's films. Uh, I just love everything about Memento. I have never seen a movie like it. I, there are a lot of movies on this list that I can say that about, but truly Memento over all of the others, I've never seen anything like it. It may not be my favorite because of the complexity, but complex is the word that I would use for sure, although it's not a word I will use for Dark Knight Rises. Dark Knight Rises, much more, you like the transition there, much more straightforward. Uh, man, I, this is so divisive. Out of all of Nolan's films, I would say even over Tenet, we're, we're early, but I would say this is the most divisive. You know what? And I gotta be honest with you guys. Oh, he's losing all of his credibility. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. And I know people have issues. I get it. And even some of those issues I can get behind. The whole nuke thing at the end, I'm like, he, people would probably die. I get that. But there's always an explanation, even if you don't buy that explanation. Nolan includes plenty of explanations in this film to where you just kind of sit back and say, okay, I know the argument is always how... Did Batman get back to Gotham? Well, the simple explanation is he's the Batman. Well, that doesn't work when it comes to a narrative. That's not, uh, that's not what we look at in film school. But that's exactly kind of what works for this film is it's a bit more outlandish than Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. But there's so much good here. It is so epic. That battle in Gotham is awesome. I love the theme music. Hans Zimmer not only takes his Batman score and upgrades it, uh, but he gives us an incredible Bane theme. I thought Bane was fantastic in this movie. Tom Hardy as the character, even though sometimes you have trouble understanding him. That's something that Nolan's known for. And I'll stop with this. The first time I watched this in a theater, I watched it six times, I believe. Um, I had one of the best theatrical experiences of my life. The epic nature of this movie blew me away, blew me away when I was a junior in high school. I was mesmerized by how this film played out and that ending, tying in everything. I've, I've heard some people argue that Batman's, you know, dead. He's not alive. Was it an ending or no? I don't. I think it was very straightforward, clear cut. Batman's still alive. Here's why. Spoilers for a movie that's seven years old, <sighs> guys. I am so sorry for doing this. I have to put Tenet on the meh tier. I'm just kidding. Y'all believe that? You didn't watch my review. I'm actually going to put Tenet on the great tier. Okay? And listen, 
You're Nolan fanboy. What are you doing, Austin? Come on, man. I have thought about this film nonstop since I saw it on Monday. And then I watched it again. And I pulled some things that I was hoping to pull, and I found what I needed. Not everything I needed. I still have questions. There's some fan theories as well, and I'm just kind of like, okay, is this a thing that's actually... So many theories online. I have one that is confirmed. It's a video on my channel. Here's the link. Uh, but there's a lot to this movie. I think too much. And I think that's part of what's pulling. I, I was texting my friend the other day. I'm like, man, general audiences, I just don't know how they're going to respond. He said his wife's going to watch it with him. And I'm like, I just don't think she's going to like it just because of the kind of movie that it is. And knowing what you're in for, I believe, helps. Knowing that it is kind of Nolan's sci-fi version of James Bond. Knowing that uh, after that first act, which I will admit I think was too convoluted. I think there's too much and it feels... A little bit choppy, right? But after that, it starts coming together. Red, blue, that's all I'll say. And that's when things start to shift, literally, and change, I believe, for the better. And that's when I'm like, I'm all in. I am 100% on board with where this movie is moving to. And now that I know details that I didn't know after walking out of the theater for the first time, I don't know if my score has changed, necessarily. We'll see on future rewatches. Um, but I believe I'm more content and happy with the fact that I think this is actually a pretty great movie. I mean, it is one of my favorite movies of the year. Granted, not a lot of competition, but it is one of those films that I believe you can dive into and get a lot out of it. And I've also seen, and we'll go back to convoluted, complex, I've seen that argument online, and I can see both sides. I've seen some critics that are friends of mine like, okay, this is just a bit too much, and I get it. And then I've also seen some critics who are like, it's complex in a way to where you just have to dive in to understand it. I think I'm more in that camp. But it's one of the only Nolan movies that I can see both sides. Like, if you tell me you hate The Dark Knight, I don't know if I see that. If you tell me you hate Tenet, I understand it more. Either way, this is my list. This is where we are. This is it. Now, we're going to rank them. So at the bottom, at number 11, I have Following, followed by Insomnia. I just believe Insomnia is slightly better. Let's move up to the great tier. These three are a bit more difficult to rank. I'm actually going to put... Man, this is... This is low and it hurts. I'm going to put The Dark Knight Rises at the 9 spot, followed by, um, you know, even though my score is a little bit higher right now, I think I'm going to put Tenet above Dunkirk. I just feel as if I've gotten more on my rewatch. At the bottom of the awesome tier, still awesome, I have to put Prestige, followed by Batman Begins. I'm just a huge Batman fan. Now, these two are extremely difficult. I think Memento is maybe a better movie, but my heart... My heart really wants me to put Interstellar at that three spot. I just don't know if I can do it yet. Maybe another rewatch, but I still believe Memento is possibly the crowning achievement, and that alone gets it to the top of the awesome tier. As for the all-time tier, and you all probably know this, I must put Inception at number two, because The Dark Knight is not only my favorite Christopher Nolan movie. Come on, guys. It is my number one movie of all time. Commissioner. I could talk about Christopher Nolan all day, guys. I appreciate you so much for watching this video. Hey, if you don't mind, if you enjoyed this ranking, if you didn't, you're probably already gone. If you enjoy this ranking, be sure to smash that thumbs up button. It helps out this video. It helps out this channel. It encourages me uh, that you'd like to see more tier lists. I don't do enough tier lists. Who is a director you'd like to see next? Preferably uh, one that has a movie coming out this year. We've already tackled Denis Villeneuve, David Fincher. Maybe we could do, I don't know, Wes Anderson. That would be fun. A Scorsese. So many things to talk about when it comes to directors. Christopher Nolan clearly being one of my favorites. Number two all time for me. Uh, I just, I love him so much. Thank you guys for watching this video. Appreciate you so much. And um, can't wait to see how this is received.